Now, Sudan has been marking a year since the overthrow of dictator Omar al-Bashir. Then there were high hopes that the northeast African nation would overcome 30 years of corruption and economic decline. But a year on, those hopes are a long way from being fulfilled. On top of economic stagnation, the country is also dealing with swarms of locusts eating the crops and the coronavirus pandemic. DW's Aya Ibrahim has been catching up with a friend she made there during those heady days of revolution. It was a moment of relief and euphoria. April 11, 2019. Protesters in Sudan's capital celebrate the removal of dictator Omar al-Bashir. The months they'd risked their lives on the streets had not been in vain. It was there and then that I met Mohammed Hamida, a photographer in the middle of the revolution. My pictures are for the coming generations. The experience of the people in my photos should not be forgotten. It was a time of violence. Authorities often attacked the protesters. The government has to bring justice to the people that died. We are alive because of them. Everything that has happened is because they sacrificed their lives. Those now considered martyrs by many are not forgotten but their families have not yet seen prosecutions. I asked Prime Minister Hamdok about this issue back in February. Absolutely. The constitutional document, which is guiding this transitional period, has a very clear undertaking that we establish an investigation committee. So let us not jump to conclusion. Hamdok heads a new government that was sworn in in August after a transitional deal was struck between civilians and the military. Al-Bashir is in prison for corruption, while his former ruling party has been dissolved. Sudanese officials have suggested they might even turn him over to the International Criminal Court for trial over alleged war crimes committed in Darfur. Yet Sudan's economy is still dire, and attempts to improve things are hindered by the country's continued presence on the USA's list of state sponsors of terrorism. Many young people who protested and celebrated a year ago have moved abroad in search of a job. Mohammed now lives and works in the United Arab Emirates. I wanted to stay in my country with my family, but there were very little opportunities. This is a time when Sudan especially needs us. He might not be able to be at home to mark the anniversary, but like millions of Sudanese, the heady days of hope in April 2019 will be etched in their memory for a lifetime. All right, uh, Aya Ibrahim uh, joins us now. Welcome, uh, Aya. So a year since uh, Omar Bashir uh, was tappled, what's the, the mood in Sudan? I think there's quite a bit of frustration for a number of reasons. First, uh, Sudanese people can't go out and celebrate the first year anniversary of this you know, very emotional day for them because of the coronavirus restrictions. But there are also a lot of frustrations because of the economic situation. Um, you know, as we mentioned, um, Sudan's economy was already doing very badly and, um, you know, crisis after crisis has exacerbated uh, these problems. But there are also frustrations with a number of uh, issues related to the transition themselves and uh, itself. And I think chief among those is the uh, issue of investigation into violence used by um, authorities, alleged violence used by authorities against protesters during the period of the uprising. That, that, that's contentious. Do, do, do protesters expect to get justice then? I mean, the civilian government has signaled time and time again that it is working on it. As the prime minister in the piece indicated, there is a committee that has uh, been uh, established to look into this violence. But this committee has really taken a lot of time. They've delayed the report by uh, three months with no results. And what's frustrating about this is that for a lot of protesters, there's no doubt about it. They've seen, uh, you know, uh, security forces attack attack protesters, especially on June 3rd when they uh, broke up the protest camp. But also, it's not just the authorities that are looking to these protests. There have been multiple journalistic investigative works in the past year that have shown evidence that, you know, clear as day who was involved. And also, a lot of NGOs have presented a lot of evidence. So a lot of protesters are saying, well, these people have the evidence. What are you doing? Why don't we have results? Um, um, what is the suspicion there? Is, is it that, that 
it's a suspicion that, that the, the civilian side is sort of uh, being out, outgunned, as it were, by the military, or, or, or is there an attempt just to suppress the I whole mean, thing? This, I mean, we can speculate, we can guess, we have some pretty good uh, clues as to why. So one... Uh, you know, armed group called the Rapid Support Forces, which a lot of protesters really believe was, uh, you know, involved in the violence against this protesters. Is, this, this was a, a regime force. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, the leader of the Rapid Support Forces is someone who is sitting on the Sovereign Council, someone who is still very much uh, uh, involved in the running of Sudan, makes public appearances. So, um, you know, it begs the question of, well, if they really do take this seriously, isn't there a conflict of interest in the people that are now you know, part of the regime. But I will say that there is a, there's also a recognition among protesters that, you know, they they look around and they see Sudan kind of still at a relatively peaceful stage because civilians and military forces were able to find a compromise. When you look at other parts uh, of the Middle East where this couldn't happen, this couldn't happen, the military has gotten way too involved and then, you know, a lot of the accomplishments of these uprisings were totally taken back. I mean, just, just, just on that idea of holding people to, to, to account, to, uh, we've, we've heard this year that Sudanese officials have said that they want to hand their former leader uh, over to the, um, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, in, in The Hague for alleged war crimes in Darfur. So where is that up to? Well, this announcement actually came in the context of the internal peace talks in Darfur that the transitional government is now holding with rebel, rebels in Darfur. And this was very, very important to the Darfuris that this... Uh, become that this happens, that Omar al-Bashir does answer to his crimes in front of the ICC. What they didn't do is that they didn't specify if he was going to appear in The Hague, if he was going to be extradited, so to speak, or if it would be an ICC complicit, uh, uh, sorry, compliant court in the region, uh, in Sudan. Uh, and um, they basically just made that announcement. They said he would appear and there wasn't really a lot of follow-up. But a lot of people that I've spoken to say it's, it's very unlikely that he's going to be extradited because that would definitely raise a lot of eyebrows from his henchmen who are complicit in his crimes, of okay. course, alleged D crimes. DW reporter Aya Ibrahim, thank you.